This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. And by Cafe Himbo Cookbooks, celebrating his 10th anniversary. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and oh sweet Lucifer, what now? Salutations and blessings upon... Oh, cut the enunciation routine and get to the point, Donna. Hmm. I will have you know that I am here on official business. <laughs> really? And what have I done that's got your higher-ups halos in a twist? You know full well that one of our conditions for making these trials public is doing a Christmas episode every year. Come on, I was asked to do La La Land. Besides, it kind of counts. There's that one scene in the restaurant. Now, now, you may have gotten away with that for Mame, but we will not be fooled twice. <sighs> Fine, but what do you expect me to do about it now? It's July, and thanks to global warming, parts of the mortal world are making this place look positively balmy. Well, it just so happens that I have just the solution. Oh, sweet Lucifer, not a third-tier Rankin-Bass sequel slash crossover. You can't deny that it's thematically appropriate. All right, all right, if it'll keep you off my tail. It was probably only a matter of time before I dove into the darker recesses of holiday stop motion anyway. That's what I thought. I'll leave you to it. Gee, thanks. Well, let's examine the case of Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July. It's a steamy minus 10 degree June day at the North Pole, and Rudolph and Frosty are hanging together because, by the way, they're friends now. Frosty and his wife Crystal, he was married in one of the other specials, I'm not looking up which one, now have two kids named Millie and Chili, and it is way too early in this trial to make me think about the mechanics of snow person conception. But then, suddenly Rudolph's nose starts going on the fritz, and the music gets rather cheerful for how grim everybody looks about that. After a lengthy credit sequence, Santa comes on to do some backstory. It seems that long ago, the North Pole was ruled by an evil sorcerer king named Winterbolt, who spread fear and terror as evil sorcerer kings are wont to do. But one day, Lady Boreal, the corporeal form of the Northern Lights, decided to put a stop to that nonsense. King Winterbolt, for years I have seen your malevolent cruelty, and now I take human form to command thee, stop this tyranny at once. Let's make this quick. I have a selfish prince to turn into a beast at three. Boreal defeats Winterbolt and puts him in a magic coma, but can only keep him there for as long as her magic holds out. Meanwhile, the good creatures return to the North Pole, first the animals, and then the toy-making elves, and then the clauses, and sin number one, this movie has more prologue exposition than Fellowship of the Ring. This is some of the most convoluted backstory of any holiday media out there, and I'm including that weird shit L. Frank Baum cooked up. It's a bit excessive for something that has the same basic premise as a used car dealership promotion. Eventually, Boreal's power begins to wane, Winterbolt awakes from his long winter's nap, and is none too pleased to find a major toy factory and distribution center has sprung up in his backyard. So he asks the genie of the ice scepter, there's a genie of the ice scepter, by the way, how he can put Santa out of commission. Have the snow dragons create a storm of ice and fog, the likes of which the North has never seen. Santa will become hopelessly lost. Yeah, you can probably guess where this is going. Lady Boreal uses her last bit of magic on baby Rudolph, granting him his trademark nose and also a mark on his right forehoof as a sign of her favor. Before she departs for the Northern Lights, she warns Rudolph that if he ever uses her gift for evil, he'll lose it which is quite a lot to be putting on an hour-old fawn. You all know the rest. Although that isn't going to stop the movie from showing it anyway. There are a lot of these recaps in this film, and they're all irritating. It's like watching those old Looney Tunes movies that were mostly cobbled together from earlier shorts, only not as entertaining. 
So now we're back where we started, with Winterbolt being the cause of Rudolph's nose issues. Except he shouldn't be able to do that based on what we've seen so far. Whatever, it doesn't stick, so Winterbolt goes back to the genie for an explanation. He has the wonder of the Aurora Borealis within him, a power far greater than thine. And this is why research is an important stage in every evil scheme. The genie explains that Lady Boreal's protection is still on the North Pole, so Rudolph needs to be away from the Arctic in order to be vulnerable. Winterbolt isn't interested in waiting for Rudolph to go on his usual holiday journey, so he looks into his magic snow palantir for a solution. What's this? A balloon? Apparently, the key to stopping Rudolph is the Wizard of Oz. This balloon contains Milton the Flying Ice Cream Man. By the way, there's a Flying Ice Cream Man now. Look, I know this is a cheesy holiday special and not even a top-tier one at that, but it's still really lousy at setting stuff up. It feels more like that creative exercise where you take turns making up a story as you go along. But then Winterbolt woke up and he was determined to destroy Santa Claus, so he... Asked the magic genie who lived in a scepter what to do, and the genie showed him, uh, an ice cream man in a hot air balloon. Milton, who looks like roughly 73% of adult men in Rankin Bass specials, keeps his stock of ice cream cold at the North Pole, having never heard of a miraculous invention called the freezer. He's swinging by to pick up inventory for the 4th of July, but his heart's not in it, as he is in love with the beautiful Lainey Lorraine, star of the Circus by the Sea. They were supposed to be married on the high wire, but the circus has fallen on hard times and an evil showman named Sam Spangles is threatening to buy it out. This gives Winterbolt an idea, and he uses a little Inception magic to nudge Milton in the right direction. I just got a great idea! There's only one guy who could draw the kind of crowds the Circus by the Sea needs. And that's you, Rudolph! Crystal and the kids have a yearning to go see the circus and the fireworks, despite the obvious drawbacks. This is Winterbolt's cue to step in on the pretense of being a friendly neighborhood sorcerer and propose a solution to the laws of physics. Magic amulets. If frosty crystal million chili. Wear them about their necks, they cannot melt, even though the temperature be hot enough to melt steel. Hey, he swiped those from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shut up! Oh, you stay in your flight lane. The drawback here is that the magic amulets will only last until the last firework fades on July 4th, which is a really vague deadline. I mean, are we talking Eastern or Pacific time? Do bottle rockets shot off by annoying neighbors count? I feel like we need to get the guys from Gremlins 2 in here to sort this out. What if they're eating in an airplane and they cross a time zone? I mean, it's always midnight somewhere. <laughs> anyway, Santa is perplexed by the icy fairy godfather, but agrees to let Rudolph have some vacation time. And thanks to Winterbolt's snow mind manipulation thingy, proposes swinging by on Independence Day to pick everyone up himself. So Rudolph, Frosty, and the fam set off in Milton's balloon to the circus, which is being set up by outdated stereotypes and is overseen by Lainey's mother, Lily. There's one thing life taught me. You can't live on banana splits. And thank Lucifer, she is voiced by none other than Ethel Merman, music theater legend, one of the great voices of the 20th century, and this movie's saving grace. She gets several opportunities to do what she does best, but my favorite is Chicken Today and Feathers Tomorrow, a song about rolling with life's punches that showcases her style and personality to best effect. Chicken today and feathers tomorrow, life is that way, there's some joy and some sorrow. Winterbolt's next order of business is to find a reindeer who is the anti-Rudolph. What? Why, oh master? A question the writers of this movie didn't ask near enough. Nevertheless, the genie directs Winterbolt to the Caves of Lost Rejections, just past the Forest of Burned Christmas Trees and the Hill of Broken Baubles. I'm not joking, those are the honest opposition directions. Here, Winterbolt finds a sniveling reindeer reject named Scratcher. 
Rudolph, don't mention that name. I was all set to be one of Santa's reindeer when he came along. And here we also find sin number four, which is that this movie has way too many villains. It's like Rankin and Bass knew this was going to be their last Rudolph movie and just threw in all their remaining ideas. Winterbolt is effective enough, but Scratcher is just your run-of-the-mill sneaky creep and Sam Spangles, remember him, barely figures in the plot at all. Winterbolt sends Scratcher out to lure Rudolph over to the dark side and then sets about delaying the Claus's trip south, using his ice dragons to summon up a storm that the Rudolph-less couple will be unable to navigate. Papa! It's a twister! It's a twister! This dramatic turn of events hits a screeching halt when Santa decides to indulge in sin number five, I see rainbows. All things wonderful are what you are. You shine brighter than the brightest star. This movie is already crowded enough without throwing a Santa Claus love song into the mix, and it's not improving my opinion of dopey 70s ballads. Also, the Claus's habit of calling each other Mama and Papa is an affectation that hits very differently post Mike Pence. The Clauses decide to continue on the ground, even though it would be faster and easier to just fly over the storm, which is what Winterbolt is doing in his own sleigh pulled by flying rain snakes. Yes, rain snakes. Don't look at me like that. Meanwhile, Scratcher has hooked up with Sam Spangles and put their part of the evil scheme into motion, which involves Scratcher hitting Rudolph up for a job with the circus, then claiming he's been tasked to grab something from Lily's wagon and needs Rudolph's bioluminescence to help. Hey, this bag is filled with money. The night's receipts. Ow. Oh. That's why she wants to give it to the cop. Maybe Boreal should have granted Rudolph some common sense in addition to that shiny nose. At Scratcher's direction, Rudolph hands the money to Sam Spangles in the guise of a police officer. Oblivious to all these shady doings, the circus continues. Rocking around the Christmas tree at the Christmas party hop. The best thing that I can say for this is that it's not wonderful Christmas time. Rudolph finally gets it through his tiny antlers that something's not right, what with Scratcher acting suspicious and Santa behind schedule. Frosty's a bit worried himself and suggests stopping the fireworks as a means of loopholing their way out of the situation. Why do you want to stop them, Daddy? Aren't you patriotic? Seriously, kid, you think Frosty's an American citizen? He's lucky that traffic cop didn't turn him into ICE. Unfortunately, Lily has already started the fireworks, and once the initial fuse has been lit, they can't be stopped. Which seems like a bit of a safety hazard, but hey, we have to introduce tension somewhere. So while the Frosties watch stock firework footage, with the kids having no idea their time as solid matter is numbered, Lily discovers the theft of the receipts and Rudolph realizes he's been had, at which point Winterbolt shows up to get his gloat on. Go ahead, Rudolph! I'm trying. I'm trying real hard. What the? Donna, get down here. Oh, now you want my input. Look, it's a morality thing, and I want someone from the other side to back me up on this. Do Rudolph's actions here really constitute as using his powers for evil? Well, while the common wisdom does hold that the road of good intentions leads in your direction, there are arguments to be made in his favor. Valjean's defense, for example, could be considered applicable in this case, but I'm inclined to think that Hanlon's razor is most appropriate. You can't attribute to malice what can be explained by sheer stupidity. That's the one! Yeah, that's what I thought. Winterbolt forces Rudolph to take the fall for the robbery in return for keeping the Frosty clan unmelted, and Rudolph agrees, which only further proves his selflessness, but never mind. As a result, Spangles gets ready to take over the circus, and Rudolph is shunned by everybody except Frosty, who is the only one who knows the truth, and Milton, who is just a generic nice guy like that. 
So we get Rudolph singing a sad low point song. No bed of roses, no easy way for me. But Winterbolt decides he's not done eviling yet and makes a play for Frosty's magic hat, planning to use it to create his own snow army. Given how dumb the average snow person seems to be, I can't imagine that would be an elite fighting force. He lies to Frosty, telling him he can restore Rudolph's nose if Frosty will give him the hat in trade. Meanwhile, Rudolph meets Big Ben the Clockwork Whale. He was in the New Year's special, I guess? If the cameos get any more convoluted, we'll be in Marvel territory. Big Ben gets caught up to speed and heads down to South America for a solution, and Rudolph finds Winterbolt gloating over an inanimate Frosty and leaps into action. <laughs> Rudolph not only nabs the magic hat, but also the circus money and a traditional Irish cop to put Sam Spangles under arrest. Apologies are made, happy singing all around, and oh yeah, evil ice sorcerer. No. No! My, my powers are gone! When the scepter dies, I go too! I turn, I turn, turn! I turn into a tree. Wow, way to make your villain death both creepy and disappointing. With Winterbolt's power gone, Santa and the wife are now free to move at the speed of plot. Unfortunately, the magic amulets don't work anymore, with predictable results. Not to worry, as Big Ben is back carrying Jack Frost, who had been chilling, literally and figuratively, in the Southern Hemisphere, and whose cold magic can restore the Frosties. Great jumping geranium! Santa Claus is finally coming to town! Oh hey Santa, you're just in time to be absolutely useless for everything but an Uber North. Rudolph decides to stay with the circus until they're completely out of debt, and Santa helps out by contributing enough flying reindeer feed to get the entire operation airborne. So, why they need Rudolph anymore is anybody's guess. But hey, we get Ethel Merman singing his theme song, so it's not all bad. Then how the reindeer loved him, as they shouted out with glee, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. Frosty's Christmas in July is ambitious, I'll give it that. Frank and Bass pulled out all the stops for this one, throwing together all their beloved characters and a decent antagonist for one big hurrah. But some of the stops should have stayed pushed in. There's too many characters to do everyone justice, too many narrative ideas to flow smoothly, and the whole thing runs about a half hour longer than it needs to. It's an exercise in excess, so the court of musical hell condemns those responsible to be eternally caught in a Black Friday shopping mob. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>